guard. Yes. All that. Yes. And during the other two maintenance. And a half months, maintenance. You were just running around oiling stuff. <laughs> that sounds very generic. But yes. <laughs> we were oiling stuff for those two weeks. Yes. So there's 180 of everything out here. There's 30 shelters, 180 transmitters. Requires constant maintenance. There's 45,000 screws out here. So I've taken every screw out, put every screw back in many, many, many times. So we're always doing maintenance. We're always making the transmitters better, perform better, and just so making. So if something breaks down, what's the first thing you look at? Uh, I look at a computer screen and then I, de I determine what works and what doesn't work, and then I come here to the transmitter and then I can tell you pretty much what's wrong with it before I even So you come. don't have to run around and start flipping switches. To I don't to have to it's do that. I can do it all from a control system and I've ran these for over 10 years so when something goes wrong with it I can pretty much tell you before we come out and open up a panel what is wrong with and it. And what, what would go wrong? Well, uh, for instance, these tuning coils right here. So if you want to take a look at this. So this is an electromechanical device. It's got motors that move this thing up and down. So it has to move smoothly up and down, and it has to do that in now about. It's moving up and down. <laughs> oh, I see. There's okay. a screw thing. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah got So I have a motor which is driving this back screw here, and all of this needs to be level, and it needs to be lubricated so that it can flow smoothly up and down. Like when you come oil it. So it needs to be not only that, but it, the old oil has to be cleaned off of it so it's not all gummed up. We put new oil on it, we run it up and down, we make sure the motor's doing what it's supposed to do. And when I tell this thing to tune to a certain frequency, it has to go to that spot. And with our test equipment, I can tell you that it's gone to that spot, or I can set it up to make it go to that spot. So this spot. is the frequency determinator? This is one of the determinators, correct. It, it has to be set up properly to match whatever frequency that we're putting into the vacuum tube, from 2.8 to 10 megahertz. So this particular component, does fail from time to time and if it does not tune properly the RF energy is such in here that it will melt this. It's not good so then I have to haul the whole thing out, put a new one in and recalibrate it. How often does that happen? All the time. Oh no. Well it, you know so if you owned 180 trucks you would always be filling up air pressure, changing a starter, changing an oil. Well, oil this is just another oil change. It's just another starter or alternator or exhaust system. So if you own 180 trucks, that's so there's what. 180 of these things. 180 transmitters out here housed in the 30 different shelters. So we're always working on something. Everything has a multiple of 180. For instance, there's two tubes per side. So that's four of them for these. So there's 720 vacuum tubes. So 180 and how many transmitters. How many of you guys are doing this? Pardon me? How many of you guys are doing two. this? Two. I wonder you're so busy. Me and the lady in the other shelter over there. Yeah, two, two people. So it takes it takes a long time to qualify these shelters, get them operational again. And how do you know what frequency to set them at? Who tells you that? Um, you mean for maintenance or for science? For science. Well, that's they so. That. So a scientist will say, "I want to operate at this frequency, and I want this modulation, and I want to do it for five minutes or something like that." That would be the scientist. And he tells you, and then you don't. Well, now that, that would be in the operation center. Uh -huh. So out here, we individually work on transmitters to make sure they're fully functional. But this is a system. This is a so system you're, you're which just, is. You're just making it do what it's supposed to do. Somebody else then is from giving a, the order. Then from a system, we run it with an operator, correct, that operates 180 things all at one time. And that's a scientist. A uh, scientist and. Yeah. What kind of scientist? Plasma physicist. Plasma physicist. <laughs> yes, plasma. And how many of them have said that they're interested in? Once you get this up and running, they'll come. Uh, you know, I don't know. That's a better question to ask the scientists back in the operations center. I'm just stuck out here in shelters making all this stuff work. I don't really care about that stuff. <laughs> or the money or all that other stuff. As long as you get to keep making it work, right? <laughs> as long as I get to make it work, I'm happy with all of it. Yeah. I had a question about uh, impedance matching. Okay. Uh, do you do that with uh, physical characteristics or do you have a uh, way 
the, the, that's how we're tuning it. So there's a motor, which is actually moving this. This is a coil, if you will, but instead of a coil of wire, right? So we have a variable coil. And if you follow these bus bars and these things around, you, and you're getting a rectangle okay. instead of a coil. And by changing this, I'm changing the physical param the distance so that's in the here. Inductor, basically. It's an inductor. This, we call this a coil, but this is actually a transformer. This is a vacuum tube, this is a primary. This is a vacuum tube, that's a primary. The secondary of the transformer is these coils in between here. So it's magnetically coupled to the, um, to the secondary. So yeah, tuning is done with the vacuum capacitors and with and with the inductor we create That's more efficient than using like a capacitor or resistor in that. Well, in order to tune anything you need an inductor and a capacitor to make a tune tank. And so there's there's a vacuum okay. capacitor which also has a motor which is moving the physical distance in there and changing the capacitance. Yeah, yeah. And it's variable vacuum capacitor and this is a variable inductor. So we create the tune tank and the tune tank also is a transformer which takes the push-pull configuration from the tubes uh, into the two primaries, sends it into the secondary, and then out the output, which we have another output coil back here as well, and another tuning um, uh, capacitor as well. So yeah, they are, they're electromechanical devices, so they do require calibration, alignment, lubrication, and verify that everything is going correct. And as soon as, you know, one of these, uh, if this, worm gear, or excuse me, this um, cogged belt slipped, then it would offset and this wouldn't be level anymore and now you're trying to, you're trying to move this up, oh, wow, shifted, yeah. so then it's going to jam. And if it jams, then you end up with the wrong tune and then you end up with high voltages in here which are ultimately going to melt all of this stuff. So any one tune, a lot, Dave. Of, a lot of parts really move out here. <laughs> yes, exactly. Dave worked out here for <laughs> 10 or 12 years doing this exact same stuff. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Where do you get nice your oscillation tour. signal from? Uh, that comes from the operation center, right? Okay. So all, all those frequencies are just determined from the operation center. We actually have a hub shelter out here which has our RF generators in them. And then that, so it comes from the operation center, controls an RF generator out in a hub shelter, and then it gets dispersed through 30 shelters that way. Are they like tube oscillators or crystal? No, 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 it, no, it's a, a solid state. Solid state. Yes, yeah. How did it do during our 2002 quake? November 3rd. Uh, it's 9.1. Still here. <laughs> Were we here in 2002? Um, that seems the, uh, like the CP was here, right? Yeah, so it did fine. It's every, everything's still there, nothing fell over. Nope. <laughs> you gotta make sure people aren't in this whole area when it's running? Uh, nobody comes out here when we operate. There's how, only a few qualified people to actually be. How close is it safe to be here? Oh, to the fence. Oh, the fence. It seems yeah. like I remember when they were first building or something, they had warnings about flight planes not flying it over. Well, we, so nothing can prevent a plane from flying over here, but we do have an aircraft radar system which detects the planes at five nautical miles and will shut down the uh, radiation from the transmitters. Oh, really? The experiment's wow. still running in the background, however, <clears throat> the transmitters are not radiating. Oh, Until that really plane good. leaves that leaves that five nautical miles, once it leaves there, then the radiation. What would it do if <clears throat> Probably nothing, but it's just playing nice, just playing nice in the neighborhood, just so, you know. We don't want somebody to come back years later and say, my plane crashed because the heart was operating, and yeah. So we, we can prove all of that. So if anyone ever said they flew over the site and these things happened, we can prove that uh, through electronic signatures that we were not operating. So it automatically shuts. Automatically. Off. It's automatically programmed in. It doesn't require any human interaction to do that. Now this grid right outside the door, right above us here, this acting as a Faraday cage, or what is it, what is this it's, for? It's our ground screen. Okay. So all the energy that we've selected to radiate up into the ionosphere, the same amount of energy is coming down. But that energy that comes down interacts with the ground screen. It appears as a mirror to the frequencies that we operate, reflects it, goes back up, reinforces the wave into the ionosphere. Okay. And then it makes it 
fairly safe to be out here as well. I always use that word, fairly safe. <laughs> safe this, but we, we can come out here and we can work on transmitters and shelters while we're operating. If you didn't have a ground screen and say this was like good reflective ground here, would it be safe? No. 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 It wouldn't be safe. And that ground screen is, it, the physical distance is important too. How, how close it is actually to the uh, radiation elements on the tower is important. So you get your beam out there. It's got to reinforce what it does coming coming down. So coming down, it takes 90 degrees. Reflected is 180 degrees, and 90 degrees go back up. So it's 360 degrees. So the phase is right back in phase with where the initial wave that is being used to pump up. So it's reinforced that. So the distance matters. Yeah, also. it's matched to the wavelength? Yes, yeah. matched to the wavelength, which is matched to the distance to the actual uh, tower, to the radiation element of the tower. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool, huh, Dave? It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm exhausted. Oh, is Tracy still alive over there? Yeah. <laughs> it's a freaking crazy bunch of people back there. Yeah, that's a big open house. This is our biggest ever. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for